Happy Wednesday. Uh, today is June 17th, and um, this is Evita again. This is um, a live session coming to you either on Facebook uh, via Syncopated Cities Facebook page or Syncopated Cities YouTube channel. Um, Syncopated City is an online school for swing dance lessons and Lindy Hop that uh, Michael Jagger and I have been working on uh, for the past five years. And um, we're doing a lot of adjustments right now to uh, take into account uh, not only what's going on in the world, but um, really what we, we could have and should have been doing more from the beginning. Um, we're trying to educate ourselves and also get the message across very, very clearly that this dance that we all love doing, the Lindy Hop, um, is an African-American art form that we absolutely adore and want to carry on and share with people. But part of that adoration is, of course, looking back uh, to its roots, to its history and or or origins, um, and recognizing the amazing people that um, created the dance and then carried it over into this modern age. Um, so I'm really excited and actually a little bit nervous, uh, but excited mostly. Um, today, my guest that I'll be talking to is Shanna Weaver. She is a phenomenal dancer. She teaches here in New York City. Uh, she's also a jazz vocalist. And she just recently completed her teaching certificate uh, to teach music in schools, uh, which is amazing. And I think that that, um, I'm sure that that whole experience has been helping her to think about the way she teaches dance. Um, and we're going to talk about a, a, pretty, a pretty intense topic today. Um, we're going to be talking about the cause and effect of blackface in American history. Um, and I think super importantly, how it really still hurts all of us in this day and age. So without further ado, I'm going to call Shanna. But if you're there and if you're tuning in and watching, please say hello in the comments and uh, let, let me know that you're there. Um, and I will be doing my best to doctor and pay attention to the comments as I also uh, talk to Shanna. Um, so let me see where she is. We're going to give her a call. Ba -doo -ba -doo -boo -boo -doo -boo. I just thought to myself I could streamline this and maybe even, you know, call her in advance and have Shanna already there waiting. So maybe, maybe someday I'll do that and <laughs> streamline this. Hello, Tim. Hello, Yulia. Thank you guys for tuning in. And, uh, let's see if we have a Shanna. Hey. Hi, Shanna. I can hear you, and we're waiting for the image to come up. Um, oh, hi, Ron. Okay. And it also, it also see seems like uh, Michael Jagger's there. Hi, Michael. Hey. Okay, so Shanna, give me a minute. We're going to flip over to the dual screen. You look so cute. I love these glasses. Oh, Man. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, lack of sleep here and there but I'm good <laughs> well you look great you look great <laughs> thank you thank you uh, they, uh, thank you for taking some time to, to talk with with everybody out here today um you uh, really quickly uh, you just finished a teaching certificate I did um, I kind of took a year off uh, in the swing swing in the swing scene a little bit um, and decided to, you know, go back to originally do my master's um, and finish my master's. And uh, Brooklyn College had a certification program. Um, I, I have a bachelor's in jazz studies for music. So I wanted to get my music ed degree and I ended up getting the certificate even through all of this pandemic crisis and having to finish school the last two months. I was in a program where I was student teaching. I was in a classroom already. I was teaching middle school kids. And, you know, I the last day I was there, I was like, I guess I'll see you next week. We were kind of hoping not because we were like the kids. This could be a big pro problem. But yeah, at the end of it, it was just kind of a lot. It was stressful. <laughs> but um, yeah, I got my, I, by July 1st, I'll have my, my 
music teaching license. So I'll be able to teach K through 12. So yay. <laughs> oh, that I'm is so excited. Fantastic. Congratulations. Um, Thank we, you. we were talking a little bit, I guess, I don't know, earlier this week. And I was really, really interested or moved by your different approaches and thoughts already on teaching and how, yeah. you know, because there's, um, there's clearly a lot of conversation right now in our community about the way that we've been teaching Lindy right. Hop and Swing Dance. And of course, you coming from music, I mean, well, the way you teach has always powerfully embraced music. Right. Has this changed <laughs> the way? Um, it actually, um, it opened it up for me a lot more uh, just because I had to sit and really devise lesson plans for music and kind of not abandon dance, but really centralize the focus on the meaning of the music and how it works and how to teach a kid who's never picked up an instrument or knows nothing about music, how to elaborate for them to, to understand. And um, in doing that, I just kind of found that we have so much like of a catalog of music and of dance, um, especially with the music. And it goes hand in hand. And, you know, we, we had a little bit of a discussion on how Frankie um, talked about how well he danced with the band. They just were so in sync. The band understood and the, the dancers understood. And nowadays we lose that we get so used to learning choreography from the recording of that band, but we can't understand the interpretation from another band who is doing the same thing. So I feel like we, we get lost in that, but we also don't get the concept of understanding where the history goes. And, you know, I kind of got to dive in, how would I teach jazz? How would I, how would I break this down? How can I incorporate dance into this? And when I did student teaching, we did a complete lesson on uh, Cab Calloway and the Nicholas Brothers, giving the, the similarities of obviously how in tune both parties were with the music and the dance and rhythmically and showing the kids stormy weather. So that was like, to me, to watch these young kids just go, oh my God, what are these tap dancers doing? They're going everywhere. They're tapping on the bandstand. They're doing splits. I'm hearing 13 year old boys going, oh, like feeling the pain of the splits. So I thought it was hysterical, but it also enlightened them. I had these kids singing Heidi, 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 hi outside of the classroom. So that to me was like, even if you didn't learn anything, you learn the song, so that's great. And it's just kind of the same way the Lindy world, um, you know, embraces the music. And when you hear certain songs, you know when the Shim Sham's gonna start, and you know when the Big Apple is going to start, and you know as soon as you hear Shiny Stockings, mostly everybody's on the dance floor doing it. So there's a connection, there's an emotional connection, and that's exactly what a musician's point of view and what's happening with them. And we're already feeling it, we just don't know how to talk to each other without talking to each other. And <laughs> you know what I mean? We just, it just, then we're just staring at each other going, I don't know, what are you doing? I don't know. And this is, I, I think my year of study with this made, help me uh, incorporate a better understanding of how to showcase jazz um, for its entirety, for the culture, for the history, for the background and seeing the reality, you know, you can, it breaks down to everything for, for the education. And I just enjoyed the fact that when I finished the program, I was like, oh, there's a way where we can do both. We can incorporate this. And there are great dancers and great instructors. And we work, we pretty much all work together. So why can't we work together on figuring this out together? Because people are already watching us going, what are they doing? Why are they so in tuned with the music? What makes that difference? How can I dance just like Evita? How can I do what she's doing? <laughs> but that's, you know? well, yes. But, <laughs> but like, that's, yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. But the, well, that's, I, I, no, I, I learned from myself and then I look at someone and I'm like, okay, don't do that because I figured out that that doesn't work so well. <laughs> um, that's actually, um, I mean, I know that, uh, so, so our topic that we really want to, to, to focus on is, is about blackface, which is like, cool. But before we get there, just, just to kind of round out this last conversation about teaching, um, I have been really reevaluating or reassessing 
how do I teach? I mean, you know, I, I've got a lot of years experience doing it, but I'm still, you know, there's still always room to improve and there's still right. always things that we could do better. Or in fact, there's things that I think I used to be better at that I've lost because I've gotten, I don't know, sometimes I think just far away from the source and from the roots. Do you have any super concrete, like, hey, people watching, if you teach Lindy Hop or Swing Dance, it's do this. It, a lot of it is is understanding where you personally are with the music. And when that happens, you, you make a decision as an instructor, as a teacher, of setting how your pace is. Most of us are all set on doing a warm-up, learning some sequences, and then the recap from our instructors and video, and, and then we just go about that. Like, we have the in-between of information, but that's centrally where we're at, at in, in learning. And the dance world is, runs that way. It's not just the swing world. It's almost every dance world. The thing that we can do, because it's so rich in the culture and with music, and we have so many musicians, um, like you spoke with Ayal, this we have so many people, especially with Gabby and Ayal, doing these kind of, you know, medleys together. This is exactly what we need to see. But we also need to see as students how does that work? How why, how can they work together? What makes that? And as a dancer, you're mostly listening to what's happening. The audience is going to watch everything you do. We want to see what what you're doing, how in tune you are with the music, what, how your reaction is. And that's solely where you are at in the music. And most of the time we want to teach too, too big of a, a theory or too big of a thing. Like this is an amazing step I want everyone to learn, but we don't really have the concept of that direction. How do you move that way? Do you understand the movement? Do you understand how it works with the music? Do you understand why Frankie was yelling at Mickey to hit the ground right on eight? Because, you know, she was like, you're late if you're coming in. You know what I mean? Like those are those kinds of things. It's like the aerial is beautiful, but can you rhythmically do it in time and understand why? And those are the things we have favorite dancers. We see everyone do these things. And I think the basis is understanding you as a dancer, not necessarily what exactly that this is what the audience is craving. It's understanding, well, the audience wants to know how to get there. What is the process? And I and that's where we lose it, you know. Oh, Shanna, wait! <laughs> I've you been just, in that category too. <laughs> I love what you just said. You said the audience wants to know or see how you got there. Exactly. That is so beautiful. That and is it's part so of beautiful. Being human. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, I mean, when I first saw you dance, I was like, this woman's incredible. Like, what is she do? I was so scared to say anything to you. But it was more so of like, how does she do that? And if that's my first reaction to a person I'm watching, it's like, where, how did you get there? It's not about how how many tricks you can do it's the fact that you're so in tune with the music that something's happening there and i would love to know how you get there well, we you, can learn the step <laughs> no, yeah, no, well the other thing that you said earlier which i think is as absolute just gold is you said to teach students how to acknowledge and be with what they feel because we don't we don't put enough emphasis on that. I mean, you know, even even myself included, I think I used to teach more like that. And then I got into so much theory and technique and pedagogy, you know, which, which is still good, but not not at the sacrifice of helping a student recognize and feel like what their intuition is and how they embody what they're hearing. And I right. love that you said that because even if you're, you know, if you're teaching kids and having them listen to music, I mean, right. instead of a teacher saying, this is what it's about and you should hear this and blah, blah, blah. It's like, wait, let them, let them have an experience and then help them or encourage them to recognize that experience because right. that's, that's within them, which really yes. no, nobody else can give them or tell them. Exactly. And I think where that really breaks down into just being, you know, in the moment with your students, it it's less about you. It's because what they're looking for is how do I do it just like that person? 
How do I imitate that? And the thing is, is like, that's, that, that's, you're missing the point. It's, it's a great step. It's fantastic to do when you get it, but you have to embrace what's happening and it has to, it's not going to feel right at the beginning. That's how, you know, you have to take that step. That's a process that as a teacher as well, you have to go, well, where, where is that moment where they're missing it? Because you will have several students do the step, but did they all get the step? Did they necessarily understand why they were going there? The first time I learned to swing out, I did not like it. <laughs> I hated doing swing outs. I was like, what is the purpose of this? I did it correctly and I was like, I don't get it. Why do we need to do this? You're probably, this no th you're probably thinking, this is hard. Why, <laughs> why are we running circles around each other? <laughs> and I'm counting the numbers and I'm like, one, two, three, and I don't understand why we're gonna do yeah. this. Like it frustrated me. But then I heard the music and then I went, oh, oh, okay. And not everybody gets that. And I think that's where if I always like to, for me, when I would always teach swing outs, I would really make you think of the rhythm, like a call and response and just understanding what the pattern is, not about how you turn around each other, not switching sides, not the whole entire thing of the swing. I just need you to know the rhythm because that eight count pattern is all over the music and you actually feel it for the whole three minutes. You'll figure out where the swing out is going to go. It's not necessarily about how the steps work. Um, and it, I mean, that's something that I mean, working with you and Nathan as well, like teaching with Columbia Swings, dancing with Nathan, that was one thing as well. He was very much like, you just have to do. And I just realized in my head, I was like, they don't feel the rhythm. That's why. And if they just felt the rhythm, they would understand that the eight count, no matter what they do, is going to work. You can fake the swing out as long as you understand the rhythm makes sense. It's a shuffle rhythm. If we went into music, we would break it down that way. But that's exactly what you're going through. And I think that's where we, we focus on too much of the where's the rock step and where's when <laughs> instead of going, well, why is the rock step there? And does it have to be on one? What's the rhythm? You know what I mean? Like, cause everyone goes, why do you start on eight? Why does this start here? Well, let's listen to the music. It doesn't always start on one. Let's listen to what's called a pickup. And maybe you can understand that A, you know what I mean? There's so many ways it's fun, but it's the process. As, as teachers, we have to also think like our students, what do they want? What are they asking for? And in their body, if you can see that they're not getting it, it that's your answer right there. They're not feeling what's supposed to happen. And no matter how much you bounce in front of them and just keep trying to sing the rhythm, if they can't feel it, you just look like a person bouncing in front of them trying to do the rhythm. <laughs> They're like, Shana. okay, so when do I rock step? <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So when do I go? When do I go? Where's the when one? Go? Where's Man, the one? <laughs> okay, well, clearly, Shanna, we need to have like a whole nother... Right. A whole nother session with you that's just talking about teaching because I can I can just hear and I know that as a musician and as just finishing your certificate and as as just a teacher yourself I mean I think we could talk about this for hours. Oh my god, this um, could be a wing talk. <laughs> this is this is just this is amazing. But but I know that we wanted to tackle uh, yes. this uncomfortable uh, topic, which is blackface so yeah. maybe maybe people watching are unaware especially if maybe if we have some people in Europe yes. or, or maybe some people who even uh, English is you know their second or third or fourth language you know what what exactly is blackface so um, this is a very big context because this is more of a tradition that you know we'll get into with this lesson um, but a more of a tradition that began in Europe, moved into the United States, and was and just kind of progressed into what was called the Jim Crow era of this negativity and neg and the the invention of the stereotypes, which really proceeded to be negative. And I kind of brought this up because. Um, recently there was a post, uh, with Instagram influencers who post, uh, who posed in blackface and were saying that they stood, I, yeah, first of all, I just couldn't understand. But the, the other part was they said they stood for black lives matter. And I was just like, oh my God, this is incredibly ignorant to me. And 
I and, and the ignorance made me think, well, what do people know and what what, pe- what do people not know? And, you know, if people who are Instagram influencers posting that they stand with Black Lives Matter, something that is really right now affecting the United States a lot, um, it's best to do your research since you are an influencer to find out if what you're trying to do and what you're trying to advocate is proper and appropriate. Because to me, that is just as poor taste as seeing a, a rope on a tree. That's just as bad. And right now we are dealing with the reality of that. So I feel that this is information that people need to understand because one, you don't learn this in school. No one teaches this in school. You vaguely get the information of Jim Crow segregation, but you understand it more in the civil rights context. They don't explain to you very much how it started and why it was there. And for those who are who are swing dancers, knowing and understanding the cakewalk, the essence of the cakewalk and the understanding of what that meant is the same understanding of what blackface really was to mocking the African-American community, the black community. So it was very much, if you understand that the cakewalk was the black community mocking the white community, doing what they were doing, how they were presented, the white community since this started has been continuously mocking the black community by using negative stereotypes that were invented by this white community to attack this stereotypical way. And this entire thing, it's very short. I gave very brief information, but it gives a lot to just think about how it was presented and how it was perceived early on and how it's been perceived since then. And it's just a cause and effect that really break down how this is affecting and has been affecting the black community in the United States. So well, let's, yes. I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to okay. go through the slides and, um, and I'll, I'll tell you what slide we're on. Cause I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it as, as everybody okay. else. Oh, we're about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Here we go, everybody. So this is the first slide. This is um, The Cause and Effect of Blackface, A Brief History into the Depths of Racism by Shanna Maria Weaver. That's me. <laughs> yeah, that is you. And And let me know in the comments, everybody, if for whatever reason... You can't see this, but I'm assuming that it's coming through. Let let us know. There it is. Thanks, Tim. By the way, Shanna, I just need to let you know, Tim uh, was shouting out your name, and he says, I love teaching with Shanna. So ah. I think that's important. That's important to let people know. Tim <laughs> is a sweetheart. He's a great. Yeah. I still, I can't wait till this is all over. We still got to do our, our over-the-shoulder flip, Tim. I, I see you. I mean, yeah. I don't see you, but, you know, I see you. <laughs> she sees you. So, so we're gonna we're gonna move to the uh, the first slide. This is the dark history into blackface. Um, yes. The roots date back to uh, centuries old European theatrical productions, most famously Shakespeare's Othello. Um, practice mm-hmm. began in the United States in the 18th century, where European immigrants brought the genre over and performed in seaports along the Northeast. Uh, and then it gives the source there, Daphne Brooks, professor of African-American studies and theater. So, so what, uh, you know, the, it, I did not know that it was actually a European thing brought over. I actually, I thought that it had started in New York City So that is the interesting thing because I was looking this up as well going, okay, well, the origins I knew of how um, it started here, but 
I didn't know that and it made sense to me, not in the sense that it should have happened, but no. the fact that it was Shakespeare's Othello, I went, oh, okay, well, yeah, they would end up doing that blackface because mm -hmm. they were trying to portray them more. Um, but that, um, that goes further back. And the fact that it was moved um, here as a, you know, something that they could just kind of perform in seaports is something that just, it was like at first, like nobody really knows about this. So let's just kind of do it here and see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't until um, the, you know, until we go into talking about uh, Dartmouth Rice or Timothy Rice, who is the one who went right. into. Yeah, I, I looked up his name, Thomas Dartmouth Rice. He was yes. he was actually a performer and a playwright, and he's mm -hmm. accredited with creating this Jim Crow character in 1830. And the Jim yes. Crow character was sort of this this cartoon, you know, exaggerated. Right. Um, exaggerated, like, you know, false imagined character. And it was right. exaggerating these negative stereotypes, as you were saying, like being lazy or ignorant or right. cowardly or hypersexualized. Right. And all of those things are just like grotesque exaggerations that they were plucking out to choose to attach to this right. figure that, that he right. created. And, you know, something I thought was interesting is it was, I think first, it was a thought, to, it was thought to be a comedy. It was thought to be entertaining and to make people laugh. But really, right. white people were not understanding how demeaning and how hurtful this right. was. I mean, it never right. feels good if somebody's making a joke about you and things about right. you. It's, 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 that's, that's just and, mean. And that was the thing that, like, you know, especially in, in, in this slide, in the, in the PDFs, one of the things I highlighted was that, you know, white performers in black blackface played characters that perpetuated a range of negative stereotypes about African Americans. So as you, as we were pointing out, it, them saying they're being lazy, ignorant, superstitious, hypersexual, criminal, or cowardly, that those are things where it's just the fact that he, what he started was a minstrel craze and the booming success should tell you more of the story of how ignorant or even how evil that move was to depict someone that they more that they feared because of of the obviousness of well we messed up and we created this problem so we have to keep engaging negatively and it's a frustrating moment because that that mentality stayed completely true um and i know we have we have a photo um a couple of photos yes i would definitely i, I have my PDF in the background looking aside as well. So I'm like, okay. I can still see this. So I'm back to sharing the screen. We're going to move to the next slide. This is actually the invita in invention of stereotypes. Real quick before we continue to talk about this, Brandon mm -hmm. Barker says, hey, Brandon. Santa Banana, it's your little brother here. Hey. Thanks so much for using this time to pull back the curtain and go through these essential conce uh, concepts revealing how far back these problematic concepts go hoping that we can have more realistic and unapologetic discussions like this in the Lindy community going forward without this annoying yes. idea of being a killjoy. Hell yeah, Brandon. Oh, Brandon. Well said, well said. Awesome. Thanks for tuning him. in. Yes. So, um, so, so Shanna, we're on the slide now. This is the invention of stereotypes. So there you see the guy's name. Just for my, I'm so sorry, I'm, my ignorance, was Thomas Dartmouth Dandy Rice, was he a white guy or a black guy? Yeah, he was he, white. He was a white guy that was creating yes. this this as a performer playwright. Okay. He had a, he had, a, um, he used the character from someone he obviously had working for him. He uh -huh. obviously owned and saw what he, what he was doing and created this character. And the essence of the character is is basically the beginning not even just the beginning but showing you blatantly that what racism truly is because the photo that is depicted for jim crow has been basically the photo that everyone is seeing as that's 
a that's a black man that's black america that's mm. what we see as black people so to include so, so we to, see we see these tattered clothes exactly. and we see this sloppy quality and so it's 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 putting this image like any propaganda into people's minds and it's not letting right. them think outside the box it's not letting and, them imagine yeah and and what's interesting you know i don't know if you're showing the visual i'm not sure yeah yeah i just okay. we're we're on the photo now okay so just so we can all you know visually see one of the things that we see in the entire picture in the corners are the faces of devils of evil of some sort holding the curtains you have the jim crow character of the depiction of the ignorant black man standing next to a monkey with a umbrella over him dressed very similarly to him to the black man standing there in such a minstrel type of way a lot of negative images adding to it just to make it look like that this is what we see oh we were only poking fun no there's some sort of truth in this and this is in the early, this is in the late 1800s you know this is in the 1830s that this was shown so then when you have another photo um like uh i don't know if you're showing the next photo but the next sure, photo sure yeah i'll slide to the next photo oh well but these are just all so terrible exactly and this is this is something the reality if that if you've seen it, then you know. If you haven't seen it, here is a depiction of Shirley Temple and Hannah Washington in The Littlest Rebels. And the one thing, I at first wasn't going to use this photo until I looked into Hannah Washington's eyes. Because the obvious discomfort and unhappiness. And also, this is 1935. This is about 100 years over to when yeah. this was invented and now still portrayed in photos in movies and a young black woman sitting there having to do this role knowing the reality of i have to eat i have to just get this done i need to make sure i can live and do this just so it worked for her the sad reality of the pain in her eyes, feeling her ancestors, obvious from a hundred years ago of this being created, having someone stare right there, not looking happy at all. Doesn't matter if it was a clip from a scene or not, the uncomfortableness is obvious in Hannah's eyes. And that to me spoke more yeah. because she has to sit next to Shirley Temple, the named actress, the one making all of the money in this time. And she has to just say it's fine and play along with the character disturbing sad and yeah. frustrating but no this, this is, is the, uh, no Yep. Yep. The first tap dancer. Yep. I'm so sorry. I muted myself. Whoops. Uh -oh. Okay, let's let's try I could that again. Hear you. <laughs> you could hear me. I was muted. I could hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes when I flip from sharing my screen back to us, because uh -huh. now it's us, two, our, our two faces. Um, thanks, everybody. So sorry. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I wanted to say is that last week I spoke with Ryan Francois, and he mentioned Master Juba whose actual mm -hmm. name was William Henry Lane. And he was a black man who was uh, trying to survive as a performer and he had to put on black face even though he was yep. black to entertain yep. people. But it's how he survived. And, and in fact, he was also accredited by some as being the first tap dancer or the one to yep. 
bring tap dance yep. into into it. Um, but uh, there's there's a book called um, It Was Play or Starve, acting in the 19th century American popular theater by John Hanners and, okay. um, or John Hanner. And it was just, um, you know, he talks about Master Juba and, and mm -hmm. how tragic it was that he still, even though he was making money and quite popular and getting work, that he would still have to perform or dance to eat each night. And they claim yep. that he died literally from exhaustion and overwork. Yep trying to constantly maintain this life of keeping up and keeping up and performing. And, and I just, it, it's just such a terrible example of, of a performer having to keep up with the entertainment of white people's uh, sort of, well, not sort of, like complete, completely malicious, evil, oh, yeah. grotesque uh, oh, yeah. comedies. And, and what's sad is somebody who you know was trying to continue to eat and make money and and you know live and was still performing is like it's catering to look at most of your known well performers who are black who were black who have passed on like louis armstrong had been playing till his death ella fitzgerald had been performing till her death a lot of black artists who were known and loved and made millions were still scrounging around to eat. Chuck Berry was still going on tour before, you know, and he basically died on the road. It's one of those things where the reality is, is that we are in love with the culture, but we have no idea how to support it because we're because we live in a world where white America is too afraid to realize that they messed up for a long time and are are not able to come to terms with this. Oh, we messed up. We need to fix this. Instead, they're just finding excuses, and it's not. <laughs> How does this help anybody? It's, it's not worth it. And you still see today, you will still see today, musicians who are black, who are still working, who are older because they need to make that money. Because as much as the audience enjoys them, they're not necessarily catering to them when these things happen, when we're all having to stand and fight to prove that we're actually people. And that, that to me is just a sad reality because if you feel so guilty about what your people have done, what that has done to America, then come to terms with it and work to change it. It's not one thing to come to terms with it. Some most people just go, well, it happened, and sweep it under a rug. Like, do you have do you have any idea how tall this rug is now with all this stuff you just kept sweeping under it? Like, it's ridiculous. We're like a country who's like nothing to see here. It's totally fine. We're good, guys. It's not. We're not good. And this is just the reality. And the sad part is, is that this is keep this this act of blackface is constantly happening. And and the excuses are no longer valid. There there is no excuse. And it's like if I have to share this to the entire world as a PDF lesson, then by all means I will. I will have a video and use content, but there's no excuse anymore. And the people in in the United States who are still trying to find an excuse for that, you grew up in this country, so you have enough information to find out. It's not my fault that in school they didn't teach you this because they were too ashamed about it. They realize that it's not good. They want to laugh about it, but most of the laughs are uncomfortable. I, it's like, I agree. that's not great. No, I but, agree. I mean, not only are we not doing a good job of teaching this material in school, but but even when it is mentioned or talked about, it is not it's not dealt with well, you know. Right. I, I think you're right. The guilt, the denial, the discomfort that probably the teacher has. You know, or, oh, I don't exactly. want to talk about this because then the parents of my students are going to come and say, why are you saying these, you know, uncomfortable things? And it's like, right. well, we have to we have to deal with it at some point. Um, exactly. And I, I wanted to bring up Master Juba and that whole situation uh, or, or that I wanted to bring him up as an example because it made me think about this picture of Hannah Washington, which I'm going to yeah. I'm going to take us back to now. 
um, it just made me think about that look on her face and that feeling yeah. of she she got this part in the movie and it's a it's a way for her to survive, but it is so incredibly uncomfortable and demeaning and wrong and 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 really really sad. I um I is it all right if we move to the next slide? Oh no problem. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Also while we're here we can just say Brandon says preach, Shanna, preach. <laughs> Um, and, and, and Sue is saying, I have to tell you that I love this broadcast. Thank you, Sue. We oh, thank, th you. thank you for the encouragement because, you know, it's, it's a scary thing to talk about, but, but it's important. Um, so this slide, Shauna, is the traumatic effect of blackface. This is what yes. we're looking at right now. One of the things I want to point out, and I know every, that everybody can see it, but one of the biggest things is that second bullet point that's talking about it's an assertion of power and control. It allows a society to routinely and historically imagine African American and African Americans as not fully human. It serves to rationalize violence and Jim Crow segregation. And that has never been more true than, than mm -hmm. ever. Just right. because knowing that, that a society is routinely and historically imagining African Americans as not fully human. And if we remember that Jim Crow picture, how much of a resemblance that they were using to mock the picture of Jim Crow next to a monkey who was dressed exactly like him, depicting those evil, those, those criminal, cowardly, ignorant kind of stereotypes. The invention of this, the invention, the use of blackface gave, paved the way for the invention of stereotypes. And it made that unnecessary problem that we ha that we are continuously having because we are using that stereotype to build off judging people we have no idea about, especially black people, because white people had put on the blackface, did the performances and immediately felt bad and went, well, that, you know, it was just a joke. And the reality is, is it's not a joke. The sad reality is, is you really think that people who are black are actually ignorant or cowardly or criminal or hypersexual. The world is turning their backs and using those stereotypes to benefit their excuses for racism. It's not, it, it is the truth that no one else is seeing and no one else wants to say because we're, we've been in this problem. It, everybody is in an outcry in this world and yes, it's a good reason to have an outcry. But the sad reality is that I just talked about Thomas Rice who invented this in 1830. It came back a hundred years later in 1935 with Shirley Temple, and it's still constantly happening, even on Halloween, or, you know, people putting in blackface thinking it's funny, or performing a routine in blackface. That is also incredibly inappropriate. I mean, I'm saying it right here, and I will repeat it. It is incredibly inappropriate to do a blackface routine because you did not do your research. And whatever excuse you use, it just means you're trying to va make yourself valid to what you did was okay, but it wasn't. It's not okay. You need to do your research. I'm not about to go out and whiteface and do anything incredibly ignorant. I know my history and I learned my history, but I didn't get to learn it in school. I had to go find it. So here is something given where you now know, if you don't know, now you know that this is incredibly inappropriate. And for anyone who thinks that it still is, please question, would you feel appropriate if somebody was painting themselves looking like you and saying all of ignorant and negative stereotypes about you and using it to capitalize off of your culture and make money off of a position where you know that that's incredibly offensive and incredibly inappropriate. And if you're going to use somebody of color to promote what you're doing is correct, then you have no understanding of how that person of color got to where they got, got to where they needed to get to, <laughs> got to where they were trying to achieve. 
it's a lot harder to to see it if you don't understand it and i get it if it's not if it's not affecting you you have no way to understand and make it work for you but that also is an opportunity to learn why it doesn't work for you well, and, and why oh no, no i'm sorry i'm sorry <sighs> <laughs> no, no, well, no. I was all like, go ahead, go ahead. No, you're amazing, Shanna. You're amazing. And, and I just, I just want to agree that ignorance is not an excuse. And um, I just want to read to everybody so that once again, we can remember how recent all of this was. Um, I looked up a CNN article. This is by Harmeet Kaur. Kaur, Kaur, Kaur? I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Um, but this was in uh, February 7th of 2019. And mm -hmm. basically, it was a story recalling that uh, there was the Megyn Kelly Today show, mm -hmm. and that show got canceled. This was probably in 2018 uh, mm -hmm. that, that the show happened, and this was a segment on what's wrong with Halloween outfits and what's wrong with, you know, being able to dress up in a Halloween outfit if you're just going to be, you're trying to be a character. And so basically her comments in 2018 off of her show were sort of saying, I don't, this is not, this is right. not a thing. And it's like, no, it is a thing. And, and that was, and her show got canceled. And I just, well, I was shocked that it was so recent. Also, I wanted to point out, I'm not exactly sure if this was 2018 or 2019, but Gucci, Gucci, oh, Gucci yeah. had a turtleneck sweater thing where you would pull the, the turtleneck up over to your nose and it had these big giant like lips that cut out around and I was like Whoa. okay there's so many things wrong with that not only does it look like blackface and the turtleneck of right. course was black but right. also like just sec overly sex I mean just like so inappropriate and right. I want to I want to bring it around to this quick conversation or ask what you think about this because Ignorance is not an excuse, and I think we have covered that. Also, um, cultural differences is not an excuse, because just like right. any ambassador or any visitor to a different country, you, you can't or you don't want to offend. So right. you, you got to figure out, like, oh, if I go to Italy and I, you know, you know make this gesture with my hand... That's going to mean right. something terrible and it might get me in right. trouble. So there's a responsibility there. But then right. also, um, when somebody claims that they did something for art, or in Gucci's case, for fashion, like this is for art, this is creative, this is my interpretation. It's like, okay, I get like art and interpretation can go a long, long way, but not in an uneducated or unthoughtful right unthoughtful way it's just it's just silly it shows that right. person's lack of awareness in the world and in the community or the society that they live in oh i would totally agree i feel that it there there's a fine line you're trying to cross if you're using the excuse and it's an excuse to create a art an art that is resembling a racist remark and if there's no point if there's no reason for it of anything that's trying any awareness for me it's just like don't put the blackface on like I just don't understand how many times I have to say it but it's like don't wear blackface it you don't have to stand with a community and paint your face black you don't have to in order to pay tribute to someone in a performance you don't have to paint your face black in order to find a great Halloween costume you don't have to paint your face black like there's so many I just don't understand that it's like how is this being taught like how is how is this anything that anybody has to say because it's such a it's such a frustrating way of finding a, an argument to argue and condone racial acts and to condone the stereotype because this is where it's resulting from it's using ignorance and fear in order to instill something to make you feel better about everything that's not how this works you have to if you're gonna say something racist you better know that it's racist and if you don't know why that's the reason that's your moment to learn that's how you learn I have no problem to inform someone this is what this is about this is how it is but I have more of an issue if you're 
trying to learn it, but finding an excuse to still do it. It's like, you were never here to hear me out. You were just trying to find an answer to dedicate to what you wanted and your belief and make it work for you. But that's not how this works. It's uncomfortable. It's not a comfortable topic. Blackface, even doing the research for this was very frustrating and traumatic because it's something that I wouldn't be able to go in the front of a mirror and put blackface on in order to make money. That would not be something I could do right now. I would be bawling my eyes out. I think any black American person would be bawling their eyes out. And even the white people who want to paint their face black will have some sort of uncomfortable moment and feeling because you know it's not a good moment and you know it's racist and you know it's bad and you know it doesn't feel good and you know why. That is the the purpose of this entire of this entire lesson of this entire talk is really just to understand that there is always a way. I mean, I Googled three, I just Googled how like blackface, the history of blackface. And there are so many articles to come up. So anybody who is an influencer, those who are artists and performance art, and you're trying to portray something, you had enough time to go online and Google the history of blackface. Can I stand, is it appropriate to wear blackface to, for Black Lives Matter? No, it's not. There you go. Point blank. No, period. Like done. Conversation over. Put it away. I don't care. It's well, over. and this, this, this other point that I came across, which is, you know, when, when minstrel shows were really in their heyday in 1845, but then the continuation of this comedy, the, the mm-hmm. word that I came across was it desensitized white people to really acknowledging the horrors of slavery. And it made me think also just in general about certain satire and comedy that we have now, which can, you know, in a lot of ways, um, it makes fun of the situation that we're in. Uh, there was, there was a time I want to say, I want to say when, when, uh, Stephen Colbert, who, who I love and I think is hilarious, but when he was doing the Colbert report, Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was pretending or playing the character oh, yes. of a very conservative, yes. you know, white guy. Um, right. The irony in that is that in a certain way, the the far conservative right side could actually enjoy him and watch him and think, yeah, that's right. That's exactly, exactly. And so I just think that it's really important for us to reflect on how comedy and satire can be stretched and really do damage if it's not done hyper aware or very intelligently. Right. And so right. the word that I came across, this desensitizing white people to mm-hmm. the horrors that African Americans were going through, that's the thing that really it stuck with me the most. Because again, mm-hmm. if somebody does blackface and they claim ignorance, you know, or they or they just say, I'm trying to be an artist about this. I'm trying to make a statement. It's like, right. yeah, but do you realize that, that the whole thing that you're doing is, is bringing people back to a, a mindset that is saying it's okay or that it's funny or that right. it's allowed, you know, and I just... Right. There's it's, already it's enough... It's one of those... Yeah, no, it's it's one of those things where it I I feel like we're trying to find, you know, people are trying to find the fine line, you know. Where's the line? Where can I cross it? And you know, with comedy, there's so there's so many ways comedy goes and comedy is very open. And so that's understanding the satire, understanding what is happening in front of you is one thing believing what's happening in front of you knowing that it's not necessarily true but you're like i like what is being said so it works for me so it is true that's where the problem is and that's kind of where we're at in this you know in this in the united states we are so we're so used to that you know dark humor and then you know jokes on us look at our president and having that reality of going, okay, it's not funny anymore. It's like, this is that, that it's that same sense of understanding that it's not, you know, it's not meant to be true, but you want it to be. And most right now we're living in a country where hate is 
far bigger and far stronger right now because it's easier for people just to hate one another. It's much harder for everyone to put the work in and put effort in to love and to actually try to work together. And, you know, it's, you're seeing a lot, everybody's seeing a lot of people for their true colors. A lot of people are realizing their friendships, if they were, how their friendships were and people, you know, it's hard to look at social media today. It is very mental damaging to anybody. It's hard for me to go on to see, you know, all of these hangings. That's terrifying. And it's not something that, you know, I, I, it's one of the things where it's like you read about this and you hope that it actually goes through, but when it's not working for the world and, you know, we're stuck in this <laughs> twilight zone, this is how terrifying it is. It's a twilight zone. And when people are having the uproar, it makes sense. But a lot of people, a lot of black people are extremely exhausted and extremely tired. Not everybody wants to educate everyone and they don't have to. It's not an obligation. It's not, it's not my right to do this. I do it because I, I as a teacher, as an educator, am going to the kids are the ones who need to know about their future and about their culture. And a lot of kids look like me and they want to know that they have a future and they want to know where they came from. Most, most of the time, black kids don't learn about their history in school. They don't learn unless they're going to college. They're not going to learn about their history. They're going to learn about events, you know, on, but you know, on more. That, right. On that very note, I just have to reflect back onto last week when I talked to Ryan, um, I found it so beautiful and fascinating. He actually, somebody in the comments had asked, so how did you find Lindy Hop? When did you, when did you find Lindy Hop? And Ryan said, uh, Lindy Hop found me. And, <laughs> and I, I think that's amazing. But what, what he said was that he actually learned the most about his people, his, his mm -hmm. blackness, having mm -hmm. done having gone into the dance that, that when he first, yeah. when he first saw the dance, it wasn't black people doing it, but it was only over time that he went in and he's like, wait a minute, this is from, this is from my people. And that is where he said that he learned more and developed more of a pride and where he came from. Because like you said, in school, they weren't showing or giving or giving kids who looked like him reason to feel pride, pr pride. Right. And, um, and that's just, that is heartbreaking. And, um, yeah. I mean, if I may, I, yeah. I love, it's interesting because it's like, that's exactly how it felt for me. I mean, I never, I didn't know about Hell's a Poppin' before I started, you know, going into the dance and I knew about the music. I had completely understood the music. I always wanted to do the dance, but it wasn't until understanding, you know, I learned a lot more about my culture and my history being part of this dance and realizing that like, you know, this is like my ancestors handing them, handing it down, going, make sure this keeps going, like teach them, teach these kids. And it's wonderful because you're understanding the essence of the culture and knowing the music and just having now this whole filled of understanding Lindy Hop in that vicinity is so, you know, there's so much pride and there's so much joy because it's like, there are people who look like me that are successful and I can be successful as well. I can get there. I can meet the woman who started this dance and, you know, hope, hope that I can at least keep up you know, with her and all that. But it's one of those things where you get to fully embrace and, and you were referring where you to, come from. You were referring to, to Norma. Norma. Norma Miller. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, speaking of being successful, Shanna, um, I, I think you are incredibly successful. And I, and I want you to continue to be successful. And I want anybody who is watching, if, uh, well, first of all, uh, Shanna is easily findable on Instagram and on Facebook yes. and, uh, yes. and she's here in New York City but but also yes. if anybody would like to send Shanna um, some donations uh, her Venmo account is available if you look at the bottom yes. of the screen it says uh, you can go to syncopatedcity.com forward slash live um, I know donations are hard right now because we're sending donations to lots of great causes and lots of lots yeah. of people but um, 
But if anybody out there is watching and would like to send Shanna anything for her efforts, her study, and uh, and just to support her continued endeavor Aww. in this community, yeah, please, please Thank check, you. check that out. Um, please. We're, we're just about at one hour, Shanna. And we I are. Feel like, Man. Um, I feel like, you know, there's a couple of comments that have come in on YouTube and Facebook. Okay. And uh, I feel like... Let's see, Claudia Seepin. Hello, Claudia. Um, Hello. She wrote, uh, one of the topics that I also struggled to understand at first was appropriation when it came up for mm. me last year. Um, real quickly, what? how would you, Shanna, how would you define appropriation? I know Claudia is actually from Germany. So maybe mm. maybe to help, what what is appropriation? Well, a lot of... Man, this is such a, <laughs> so much. Appropriation in a nutshell is really kind of, I'm trying to use the best example without like getting into a deep lecture. <laughs> but it's kind of putting in a, not putting in a box. I don't want to say it like that. Let's put it this way. I know. I was like, go ahead, go ahead. Cause I was like, my brain is like, <laughs> well, I, and, and, and also I don't mean to put you on the spot cause we didn't, no, really, no, 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 we no, didn't okay. prepare for this conversation to be about appropriation. But, <laughs> but, but from what I, what I have been seeing or thinking, um, I feel like appropriation in a, in, in a condensed form is when somebody who is not of a certain race or culture takes mostly artistic and creative aspects from that race and culture and they they learn it and perform it and use it and make money off of it right. um and right. and and i think at the worst claim it as their thing like you oh, know yes. like i'm good at this whatever this might be you know right. singing dancing you know whatever and music drumming you know whatever yes. they may think and then they, they claim that it's theirs. From what I understand, yes. I think there's a lot more versions of appropriation and levels you're, of it. No, you're totally, that's, I was like, that is exactly words I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> but that's actually perfect because we talked a lot about of it, about it in, you know, through our talk um, and talked about how this is something that, a dance that started in the black community very much embraced into the white community, but internationally as well. And there are several countries and, and several people, not a lot of them black or a person of color, um, well, a black person teaching these styles, even, you know, and some they're incorporating the history about Frankie and Chick Webb and it's great, but I just feel that the only problem that's happening is the people who are benefiting and who are making money and who are getting what they're getting are not necessarily advocating so much for what's happening in the community that has helped build that creation and that artistic you know venue for them that artistic opening and that is the struggle that it can that can always create the divide. It's easier to just go, well, I learned the dance, it's just the dance, I like the clothes, I like the music, and that's all that I'm about with it. And I'll teach this and it'll be easy. It can the easy it's an easy route. You know, successful, as, you have your sequence. Yeah. As you said, easy. You know, I, I wanna point out Michael also just wrote, Hi Michael Jagger. Hey Love Michael. you. Love you. <laughs> Michael wrote uh, on a Facebook comment, uh, probably this is a definition he's read or seen somewhere, that appropriation is the reframing aspects mm -hmm. of a culture through one's own cultural lens. Yes. And, yes. and yeah. And, and one more thing I'd like for us to read. Uh, Claudia, same person who asked the question also from Germany, she had a beautiful thing she wrote earlier that I just want to share. Um, yes. Evita, please keeping, uh, keep on hosting these very informative talks. Um, but also, I thank you, Shanna, because it would not be informative without oh. you, Shanna. Oh, um, thank she you. says <laughs> that I always thought that I had a very involved American history teacher, but still, I, 
I now I know now that I have to look up minstrel and etc. All these other things. Mm -hmm. Yes, the history of European racism is a different one. But as a Lindy Hopper, I do consider this to also be a part of my history, as it is an important part of the history of the dance that I love. And the tools yep. of oppression are similar. Therefore, I have so much catching up to do. Yeah, thank oh, you. Thank you, Claudia. Claudia. I appreciate that. That And that to me, and that's exactly what I'm pointing out. Like, when you know that there's something that you don't get, you don't understand, and you're part of it, you're invested, it's so much easier to actually be like, well, what else do I need to know about this? And how can I help contribute? What is it? What is going on? And she's absolutely right. I don't know the history. I don't know a lot of the history for European history. And the European history on racism is is a completely different story that only bits that I know that, I, that I've been told but never learned in school, maybe been told in passing or maybe in a class or from someone else that knows it. But it's it's never been something that's educate that's been taught in education systems and I think Claudia I think it's beautiful that you're diving into it and I appreciate that you're like this is something I love so it is part of my history and I must learn and that is the key to this that's exactly what mentality you should have if you are dedicated to something and you enjoy it and all then you enjoy everything that comes with it and it's a lot of baggage guys it is a lot of baggage Trust me, it's hard to do a swing out with that much baggage. I totally understand, but it is worth it because you start to learn and open you open yourself up to the possibilities of of you know bringing embracing people together and understanding how to stop the negative part of this and the racism of this and learn what this is because the reality is is like. There's not a lot of educators, there's not a lot of teachers right now or dance teachers that are speaking up. There are, you know, you and I've heard from Gabby and I see La Latasha, I see a lot of people that we know that we've personally worked with, you know, popping up and saying things. But a lot of the people that we've seen at big dance events or, you know, festivals, I'm not hearing a lot from them. I'm not hearing a lot of this. And we're starting to hear about, we're starting to question a lot of things. And if those people who are we're not hearing from are feeling the questions are getting too much of, of an attack, then you need to ask yourself, why are you in this dance? Because this is really deeper than anything. You can enjoy the music. You can get away from it. You can sit there and listen to Cab Calloway, but you are not going to think, but knowing you, you won't think about all of the racial trials that Cap Calloway had to go through when they went on tours as a band and knowing the racism, the segregation, that they couldn't sleep in nice hotels, that they couldn't sleep in places, they slept in their cars, they drove all night. All of these band members that you love to play, Chick Webb, even Count Basie, including Duke Ellington, all of them struggled, but they made damn sure <laughs> that they were not going to keep let it stop them they continued to push forward. And that's something you have to understand that as hard as this is, we will always push forward. It's not us that always are the ones that are gonna make that immediate change, because we can't. It's the country that realized that they've been racist for hundreds of years and are not willing to identify that that's what's been happening. And this is why we're dealing with blackface and modern day lynchings as sad as that sounds that's really what's happening in the world today and it's unfortunate but to bring it full circle what claudia said if you feel deeply for something and you want to learn about it open she has an open heart that's exactly what you have to do if you're embracing something like this this dance this culture open your heart and learn the stories there's so much more in that music, in shiny stockings that's happening in the music, in all of it that's happening that you can hear and feel. You have a particular feeling the moment you hear the opening to shiny stockings. Embrace that feeling and think about all of that. And it's so it's beautiful. There's so much to learn, but we'll have to talk about this all day. <laughs> Hannah, th this has just been amazing. Oh. I mean amazing first of all you are an incredible communicator and thank you so so much for your time and talking to us oh. about this i mean it's just this has been such a pleasure absolutely such a pleasure 
And um, thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I, I agree. We could talk for a lot longer, but we're gonna yeah. try to <laughs> we're gonna try to package it down into this this one hour. Um, in case anybody <laughs> didn't get to see this live. It's going to be available on our YouTube channel, Syncopated City's YouTube channel, and Syncopated City Facebook uh, page. And we didn't play any music, so we shouldn't get, like, you know, muted for any of it. <laughs> so please share this video with other people because um, you, you just, you're, you're an incredible communicator and speaker oh. on this, Shanna. And I know that it's exhausting and hard right now, and, and I just... I just really appreciate and thank you for, for being here with us. I appreciate the invite. I appreciate you asking me. This is wonderful. Yeah. And this is something that needs to be done. Yeah. So yeah. I'm glad to be here to do it. Cool. Again, everybody, thank you for tuning in. And please, please, please go to syncopatedcity.com forward slash live. It, the link is at the bottom of the screen. And if you've got any, uh, any little ounce of love, appreciation, thank you. Please send Shanna just a little... Thanks for, thanks for your time. Thank cool. you. All right. Till, till I see you again. Yes. <laughs> love you. I love you, girl. I love you too. Thank you, Shanna. All right. Thank you. <laughs>